from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Susan Vita, the Chief of the Music Division, and it's my really, one of the best parts of the job of being Chief of the Music Division is that you get to meet such wonderful people, composers, artists, and tonight we have one of those here along with David. <laughs> I'll slip uh, into the background no. somehow. <laughs> Um, you have to admit that George is the oh. main event. <laughs> no question. Um, so it's really, really a pleasure and an honor to kick this off and to introduce George Crum. And also with George is David Sorobin from Bridge Records. Bridge Records has been had a long association with George, having uh, recorded many, many of his works. Um, as you may know, he is a composer of a number of Library of Congress commissions, including really one of the landmark 20th century uh, Ancient Voices of Children, which he did in 1970. We are so thrilled that we have that as part of our legacy. Thank you, George. <laughs> um, this is, um, George is going to be speaking about his epic seven-volume American Songbook Cycle. Um, tonight, we open a terrific mini-series called Distinctly American, which brings six leading American composers, established and emerging, to the library to talk about their music at our concerts. I'm happy to say that we will also have two Library of Congress commissions coming up just as part of the series by Stephen Hartke and Sebastian Currier. I'm sure you know those names. There's no composer more appropriate to headline a project called Distinctly American than George Crumb. He's known for capturing an indefinable essence, a glimpse of our musical identity. George Crumb, this is a quote, George Crumb hears the heartbeat of America that's what the Los Angeles Times said. And the library is the home of America's music across a brilliant universe of styles and genres. Mr. Crumb's long and cordial relationship with the Library of Congress began with the commission of his la landmark work, Ancient Voices. And we're proud that this is one of the most notable commissions in our distinguished roster of Coolidge Foundation Commission. And we invite you, our friends and supporters in the audience, to join with us in adding to that roster. <laughs> tonight, is one, tonight, one of the artists for the performance is Gil Kalish, who was part of the performing ensemble for that Ancient Voices premiere four decades ago. We have another traveler here tonight also to, to highlight. That's Thomas Hampson, whose Song of America project with the library has brought alive many musical treasures to audiences across the nation. One can give the usual biographical statement about a composer like George Crumb. The awards, including a Fulbright Scholarship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Grammy Award, a Pulitzer Prize. How boring. <laughs> and a long association with the University of Pennsylvania. But these honors do not really communicate very much to us about a man whose music, extraordinary and evocative, moves somehow into the realm of alchemy and mysticism. A shaman of sound, George Crumb invites us into a magical realm created from his great spirit and imagination. We are very proud to be announcing this evening that his papers will become part of the library's permanent collection. Thank you so much, George. <laughs> Joining him now is David Sorobin, a producer at Bridge Records. David began playing George Crumb's music 40 years ago. Are you all that old? Yeah, I'm afraid <laughs> so. Well, I was 19. Oh, yeah, so okay, was... good. <laughs> 
He's since collaborated with Mr. Crum on producing recordings of the composer's complete output for the Bridge Records George Crum edition. Mr. Crum has composed a number of works for Mr. Sorobin, and the two have toured extensively as part of the, jo of the George Crum. Ensemble. <laughs> Sorry. Ensemble? Yeah, Thank you. ensemble. <laughs> okay, please join me in welcoming both these gentlemen to our pre-concert lecture. Thank you, um, and I thank you on behalf of George as well. Uh, tonight we're going to hear songs and, and instrumental interludes drawn from uh, George's American Songbook project. Uh, this is a project that he's been working on for the last 10 years, more or less, uh, and it's been his primary compositional activity during this time. Uh, there are now seven volumes in the cycle. Each one is approximately 40 minutes, some a little shorter, some a little longer. Uh, and the series now includes a remarkably wide range of song literature. There are Civil War songs, Native American songs, Afro-American spirituals, hymns, revival tunes, cowboy songs, Appalachian songs, and songs from virtually every, every corner of the nation. Um, I'm wondering, George, if you would speak a little bit about your background, your upbringing, and, and what may have prepared you for such an all-encompassing project as this. Yeah, I guess I'm plugged in all right. Is my voice okay? Uh, I uh, grew up in the, I was, uh, grew up in Appalachia, and my uh, parents were classical musicians. But uh, I think anybody living there was also, you know, uh, in tune with uh, country music and folk music. All these things were floating around. They were played on the radio constantly. So all of the tunes, not all of the tunes that I've used in the songbooks were familiar to me, but most of them were, you know, and they've long been in my uh, mind. Uh, and it was my daughter, Anne, finally, who, uh, suggested that I do a collection of just Appalachian folk tunes, you know. She wanted to sing them and she wanted something that would be suitable for like concert performance, you know, with a uh, regular uh, structure and so, so forth, over cover, uh, covering several songs. So I did that and she sang them and that led to other things. I, I was thinking, well, there are all these spirituals I love too. So that, that became the second uh, collection I did. Etc. You know, so forth through uh, seven volumes, and I, I'm finally finished. And I don't want to see any more uh, uh, folk songs for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what I'd like to do uh, in in this little talk <clears throat> is um, ask George some general questions about his music, and then go specifically through the uh, seven songs that have been selected for tonight's performance and talk about each of those. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit about your music. Uh, instrumental color has been a, a primary component in the shaping of your work during the last 50 years. Um, it, it's taken you in two directions as I see it. First, the, the search for new and strange and different instruments. And secondly, the, the uh, learning to find techniques for playing traditional in, in, instruments, mm -hmm. uh, techniques that may be dormant or, or that you've invented yourself. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak about the, the remarkable percussion orchestra that we'll hear tonight? Uh, there, I think most of the songbooks would have about 150 separate percussion instruments. We were worried that uh, uh, for tonight's collection <laughs> that it was gonna fit on the stage. It's not an immense stage. So they uh, scrimped and uh, so forth and pushed things together a little. So it all fitted except an instrument called the cannon drum. They have the instrument here, but it simply wouldn't fit on the stage. Uh, this is an unusual uh, type of drum, as you might imagine. I ran into this on a trip to University of uh, Idaho. A percussionist there had invented what he called the cannon drum. It was a long tube about this uh, uh, size <laughs> in <laughs> diameter. And uh, it could be 12 feet long or 15 feet long. 
And, it, and one end was uh, equipped with a, a bass drum membrane. So the percussionists would play on the side of this thing and the drum had to be pointed to the audience so they would get the full effect. Uh, and it's a stupendous sound. I'm sorry we won't have it. We're substituting simple bass drum, simply the bass drum. And, for and the, the interesting thing about this, the <laughs> usage of the cannon drum in this piece is he saves it for uh, a setting of Johnny Comes Marching Home Again. Uh, and and the, the, the sound when you, when you hear it is uh, really incredibly like real cannon. And, and I imagined myself you know, somewhere on a, on a civil war battlefield the first time I, I heard the sound, so. It's very militaristic, and I suppose one influence maybe was the Wunderhorn songs of Mahler. Many of them are kind of military songs, so I stole a little from Mahler in, in my <laughs> setting. Well, what about your relationship with the piano? Uh, it's the instrument you return to the most frequently for your solo compositions, your chamber compositions. Um, I mean, it's an instrument that, that really arguably saw its peak in the 19th century. Um, can you talk about the, the potential that you see in the instrument for an expression, both from the standpoint of the performer and the composer and, and what you've done with the instrument? Well, I think, David, the piano is almost like an instrument that can be invented. It, it is, in fact, reinvented uh, uh, every, every couple of decades, you know. For example, uh, there was Beethoven and Chopin reinvented the instrument. Brahms came along and the piano became kind of an orchestra with those very low sonorities in the wide spaced, uh, spacings. And then next we had Debussy, who uh, totally his piano, his concept of the piano sound was something entirely new. And uh, that composer was a big influence on my early music. I played some of those preludes when I was very young and it got in my ear. Debussy was always, was already pushing out the kind of the chromatic, uh, not chromatic in the musical sense, I mean the, color, the coloristic possibilities of the instrument. And uh, then I fell in love with Bartok's piano music who again uh, kind of made uh, the piano be a percussion instrument at times. It sounds like an extension of the percussion department. So something new again came into that. So these were all influences and what I've uh, tried to do myself is uh, takes off from their pushing out the color spectrum of the instrument. And for those of you who, who know George's music, uh, you know that, that his way <coughs> into the piano is, is really an inventive one. He, he experiments with all sorts of techniques inside the piano and using beaters, using thimbles, using all sorts of, of sound changers in, in terms of his piano writing. Uh, for me, uh, the use of these kinds of things is, is interesting uh, and it, they produce new sounds, but uh, in George's case, uh, for me, the most wonderful thing is he's been able to incorporate all of these sounds into very musical situations and, and, and perhaps that's, that's his greatest contribution in my opinion to, to the, the flow of, of music over time is that he's taken what we would have considered 50 years ago as unusable sounds and he's somehow melded them into his own language and, and formed something very new and very significant. Um, now, the technical requirements of, of great repertoire have, have typically forced performers to catch up and figure out these how to do these techniques. Mm -hmm. And uh, many would argue that, that your music has had that effect, pieces like Black Angels, uh, Macrocosmos, they, they really have changed what performers need to be able to do. And tonight, the listeners will hear your trademark world uh, produced by, by a lot of instruments. Cymbals and timpani will be bowed, uh, piano strings will be plucked and struck by mallets, and, and Mr. Hampson will be, be called on to whisper, shout, and, and produce a very extreme dynamic range uh, that, that this music requires. Uh, a few of these techniques were, were part of my training. I know they were not anything part of your training. Um, 
has, has the last 50 years produced a new class of virtu virtuosity that in any way rivals the, the virtuosity of the past, let's say the intellectual improvisational abilities of a Bach or the physical abilities of a Paganini or Liszt. I mean, what? I, th I think really we have a new class of performers now. Uh, for those of you who hear the concert tonight, you'll note that the pianist is Gilbert Kalish, who was one of the very early persons to play this crazy kind of music when a lot of people didn't want to touch it, you know. And by now, Gil has had students, and his students have had students, and it's incredible how quickly these things uh, pass from uh, curiosities into being part of the equipment of a, of, a, of a practicing musician. They're absorbed, you know. It's, it's, I'm amazed how fast this process works uh, because uh, you think, you know, that this maybe never will be part of the uh, technique, but there's a whole uh, number of players all over the world now who can do any of these uh, new techniques, and they can do it musically and They've had teachers like Gil. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, this is, to me, this is the primary indicator of that, that situation where you write the piece, you demand certain things, and they will follow. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tchaikovsky certainly experienced that, you know, to play the Tchaikovsky concerto now. You know, violinists just seem to toss it off, and of mm -hmm. course it was deemed unplayable. Considered unplayable yeah. at, the, at the time, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, let's, let's talk about the seven songs that, that we'll hear uh, Mr. Hampson sing tonight. Uh, Sit Down Sister uh, is the first one we'll hear. I should say that, that um, George has written all of these pieces uh, as cycles. There are seven individual cycles that each follow their own compositional logic and, and shape. Uh, but George has also said that, that you can excerpt the songs from each of the songbooks and mm -hmm. form your own cycle, as it were. And that's what, what the uh, performers tonight have done. And I think they've made a really superb choice, as you'll hear. Uh, the first tune they're, they're doing is Sit Down Sister, which is a, a gospel tune taken from uh, A Journey Beyond Time, uh, which is his cycle of Afro-American uh, songs and spirituals. And among the instruments that you use in this setting are a, a Kenyan shaker, uh, Appalachian bones, mm -hmm. uh, Chinese woodblock, African talking drums, and Philippine devil chasers. Mm -hmm. uh, your choices of instruments m m might be seen as a, as a way of creating a United Nations of percussion. <laughs> um, and I just want to know, is, is musical polyculturalism something that has strengthened or, or weakened classical music? I mean, it's something that from Mahler on We've, we've seen gradually as, a, as a, almost like a movement mm -hmm. in classical music. What, what do you, what's your take on that? I think that way too, David. I think it's uh, now we're submerged in the, the, whole, the world. The whole world is kind of one world musically. You know, in movies or uh, traveling groups of performers from uh, Bali or <laughs> we hear these sounds or we travel ourselves and hear this music other places. And the sounds are in her ear and they're wonderful collections of recordings. And even as a college student, I heard in the Folkways series, uh, you know, uh, music from Africa and uh, the uh, uh, Orient, uh, South America. And uh, I never forgot these sounds. They seem so beautiful in their own right. And I thought maybe they could be used in Western music. And in fact, many of these things had been introduced by composers over the last several decades. When Debussy uses, first of all, the cratales, those are the antique symbols uh, in, in his uh, afternoon of the phone. <coughs> Excuse me, it's a beautiful sound. It seems to fit just that moment in the music. It's not a gratuitous effect. It's a, it's an organically related to his conception there. It's just the right sound. And as David said, Mahler knows how to use the cowbells, the uh, Omglocken, the genuine ones, big ones, you know. And it has a sound that uh, it colors the whole orchestra when he uses it. Or the sleigh bells in the uh, Fourth Symphony, uh, so, et cetera. So these things, it's, it's just the whole world is getting, is getting more condensed. I mean, all these possibilities are there. In, in typical fashion, of course, 
we'll, we'll hear uh, some Almglocken tonight, but what George does, of course, is he changes the sound of, of the way the Almglocken is played, and, and you'll see it immersed into a large pail of water, which, which bends the sound and gives it a, a haunting, completely different, different sound than, than you would hear in Mahler. Um, These are more ghostly Almglocken. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Very ghostly. Uh, next we'll hear uh, uh, Shall We Gather at the River, um, and this, was, this is the song that opens, and I think very appropriately, the whole seven songbooks. Um, uh, it's from a cycle called The River of Life, and uh, this is well known to, to many of you um, through Charles Ives' use. Um, and, and George uses a very mysterious accompaniment a kind of drifting river music, he calls it, uh, which follows Ives' path in the, in the spiritual significance of the song with its message of, of really peaceful deliverance. Um, and I, I know you identify with Ives musically, but, but how about philosophically? Um, uh, that too, uh, yes, there's a kind of some of the New England transcendental feeling in Ives I've always felt. And, I guess I've inherited some of that myself. There's, a, in other words, a spirituality, kind of a, uh, uh, it's a, a little abstract in a way, but it's something you can feel as being at the foundation of his music, like the three places in New England has those moments. And many Concord Sonata would have those, uh, the songs of Ives. And uh, I've, uh, I've been influenced by Ives a good deal. Would, would I be prying if I asked if you were a religious man? Uh, I, I, I think all religions are kind of beautiful, and I'm, I'm not uh, um, one, one religion so much. I, although I grew up kind of I, going to Sunday school like all of my uh, uh, classmates or my uh, fellow kids right. in the area, you know. But I, I went through that experience, and this was Appalachia, so in that case, it was kind of a down-to-earth uh, baptism. Yeah. Ba a Baptist. And, <laughs> and we, hear, religion. we, we hear uh, in, in these cycles both uh, Old and New Testament uh, yeah. references. Um, uh, I think we'll, we'll hear Gilbert Kalish uh, probably making his debut uh, uh -huh. at, at a rather healthy age as a shofar. Player. He, he learned and, the show for you know, so uh, it's really Gil, Gil will try anything. You yes, know. he will. <laughs> well, you'll make him do anything, you know. It's uh, next song after that is sometimes I feel like a motherless child, mm -hmm. which is the closer of the Afro-American cycle, um, and I think this is almost an operatically dramatic setting uh, with the lyrics, sometimes I feel I could fly like a bird in the sky. The music mm. just surges forward and uh, to a dramatic forte. And then it seems to subside into sounds of nature. Uh, and then with the final voice, motherless children have a hard time. The music turns very bleak. And the singer turns into himself. He hums. Mm -hmm. uh, he loses his... his voice to mournful speech, and uh, the, the music finally disappears into a kind of slowly decaying silence. Um, uh, it's very dark, and I, I find that your music often visits this, this very dark side. Mm -hmm. um, is, there, is there any hope for us? Uh, I mean, Well, this, <laughs> this spiritual, of course, is very dark. I, I think it's one of the most intensely beautiful of all the spirituals. Uh, I have it progress into absolute silence, silence by degrees. I, uh, there's one place in a Tchaikovsky symphony, the Patatique, where he uses seven pianos in a row. I wouldn't have, know how to pronounce that even. Pianissimo or something, yeah. and I use that at the end of this. It, it's like the music goes into uh, absolute silence. And another characteristic is that uh, the tonality is drifting. I love the idea of a tonality that's not stable. So you may hear one phrase of the song in E minor, the first phrase. E minor, I think, then G minor, then falling to F minor, and finally back to E minor. And uh, 
uh, you had, there was another part well, to your no, question. Well, I mean, I think you, you like many other composers, mm -hmm. have a, a certain preoccupation with death, your settings of Lorca, uh, another, you know, poet absolutely consumed by mm -hmm. images of death. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this, this song also seems to me very, very bleak mm -hmm. and, and dark. And it ends this cycle in, in a very kind of, kind of down manner. And I just, you know, I mean, I, I don't really want you to answer this, but I just I want to get a sense of, 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 of your, your world and, and why it, it's always so dark. Well, I think it came from setting too much Lorca in my younger days. <laughs> <laughs> that you would know, do it. You know the famous remark of Lorca, he said, uh, in Spain, dead people are deader than any place in the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the, the next song completely turns, turns things on its head again, uh, which is, is the uh, song Hallelujah, I'm a Bum. Uh, the, the songs, I did a little research on this, and the song's authorship is uncertain, but according to hobo poetry researcher Bud L. McKillops, the words were written by an IWW member. Uh, some verses, though, may have been written by a Kansas City hobo known only as One Finger Ellis. Uh -huh. uh, he scribbled it on the wall of his prison cell in 1897. Uh, there's also a questionable theory that Harry McClintock could have written it in 1897 when he was only 15. It's, it's sung to the tune of Revive Us Again, uh -huh. and this, the song was printed by the uh, IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, in 1908 and adopted uh, by a branch as their anthem later that year. The, the song recurs frequently in the 30s film, Hallelujah, I'm a Bum, and, and uh, <laughs> Chaplin's Modern Times. And, mm -hmm. and your setting of it is... is pure slapstick. I mean, it's, it's really humorous. The singer becomes inebriated gradually. It, he, he loses his place in the song. And then he receives kind of kicks in the derriere by these percussion thwaps. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a really, yeah. it's unlike any setting in, in the entire songbook cycle it's that I know. It's a comic song. It is a comic song. Are, are you a fan of, of film, early film comedy? Uh, well, I, I saw this, these qualities in this song and uh, with this setting. It used to be a, a religious song, and then it was taken over. It became a labor song, and it, it, it was already a kind of a, uh, you know, a funny use of, uh, of, of uh, words and so forth. So then I had the idea of showing the progression uh, of drinking too much. So the last stanza. David refers to the singer loses his place and he's out of tempo, and that's all written in the score precisely. All the mistakes are notated in the score. Yeah. And, and you know, it, you really do get the sense that the, the, the singer is quite inebriated and, and just doesn't know where he is. Mm -hmm. and, and then it ends with a big, another big pop to the, to the chops, as it were. So it's, it's, a, it's a really funny song. And a, a great addition to, to the set. Um, the penultimate song we'll be hearing tonight is Black, Black, Black is the Color of My True Love's Hair uh, from your Appalachian Cycle into the Hills. Uh -huh. uh, and this combines the, the, the very traditional, well-known ballad with sort of very strange harmonies in the piano and vibraphone uh, and an almost atonal counterpoint throughout from the ensemble. And I'd like to quote George here about these songs. He says, by means of a wide range of timbres and textures, together with the use of an extended chromaticism and occasionally unusual rhythmic patterns, I have attempted to bring out the psychological depth and mysticism and also the humor inherent in Appalachian folklore. Um, I, I find this setting to be so um, crumified uh, that the original tune almost disappears uh, into your, your very personal world. And, um, I, I'd like to ask, uh, this is a bit about your compositional pro uh, process, um, but did you sometimes have the sensation that when you were working with all of these borrowed tunes that the, the tune was subsumed and, and that you were just composing uh, your own music as in, as in your non-arranged works? Mm -hmm. uh, because some, some of these pieces, to me, uh, they, they just become pure and simple, your music, and this is one of them. Yes, well, uh, 
I, I didn't set out to, to uh, you know, assimilate the music quite that way. But I, I hope that the, the, the songs would still have their identity in a sense, but yet be surrounded by a different world, you know. It would be heard in a different way because the context varies, uh, the backdrop varies, you know. The harmonies are different. Sometimes I bend the rhythm, too, a little, uh, which doesn't... Uh, make the songs unknown, you know, they're still recognizable. No, 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 no. I mean, the, the magical thing about these uh -huh. uh, works is that, that you get these tunes that we all know, we're all familiar with, uh -huh. uh, and yet the context that we hear them in is so completely altered that it, it gives new meaning, or it, it shades the songs uh -huh. in remarkable ways, I think. I and wonder if this hasn't always happened in music, those, uh, David, that composer who borrows like folk materials, you know, can uh, transform it, and yet the materials are there. I don't there. think so. I, I, yeah. I listen to, you know, let's say the Beethoven Scottish songs, uh -huh. and they don't, they don't transform those songs so no. much. I mean, they, they are of the era, yeah. but I think you've added something very different uh, here. I think mm -hmm. you've, you've um, there are all sorts of resonances to the songs and meanings of the words mm -hmm. that, that find their, their realization in these kind of subtle shadings, mm -hmm. uh, instrumental shadings. And, and, and combined with the voice, they, they, they are really haunting and, and I think great American music. Uh, I um, think David's right, uh, especially in the sense that I invented some counter melodies or material that wasn't in the original tune and uh, this is presented with the tune or is woven into the tune in different ways. Maybe that contributes partly to, the, to this effect of it says being. Yeah, yeah, uh, in some of them, some of the songs, some of the songs, I, I, the melody is foremost, and and we, but this one, it <laughs> seems to me, it's just kind of so so strange and bizarre that you you, <laughs> black, black. The, yeah, the, that the melody sort of goes to the background in a certain way, and, uh -huh. and all of this strange harmonic material kind of takes over. It's really. <laughs> This is one of the most beautiful of the American uh, songs, and uh, you know it's used also by Luciano Berrio in his work called Folk Song. His, uh, he uh, included two American songs, although he has a, uh, a United Nation array of songs, all from all different countries. Uh, it's uh, a song I've known a long time. Was, wasn't that uh, really put into its final shape by Niles? John Jacob Niles, was it? I, I think so. I think must have some folklorists out here at uh, the Library of Congress. I think he heard this on a street corner in some southern city, and uh, he got part of it down, and then he adapted it himself. I may be mistaken. Yeah. Well, no, no. Maybe another tune. The the last song that we'll hear tonight uh, is is the uh, epic Johnny Comes Marching Home Again, uh, mm -hmm. which is from your Civil War cycle, uh, yeah. The Winds of Destiny. Uh, and this, like like Joshua, fit the battle uh, is is another battle piece, mm -hmm. uh, and the the remarkable use of percussion here includes uh, the, really the harrowing sound of of these light percussion instruments that one one annotator called a skeletal army on the march, <laughs> and and it really is. Um, you you <laughs> set this song in a way that is absolutely unforgettable. No one will who leaves this auditorium tonight will will hear that song the same way again. Um, coming from, from West Virginia, as you do, uh, the sounds and smells of the, the Civil War battlefields uh, no doubt are a part of your, your inherited consciousness. Yes, and uh, on top of that, you know, I overlay things like sounds of nature. Most of the songbooks have the voices of birds, you know, or the wind sounds, uh, all of these things, the sounds of the ocean I use surf drum uh, in, in one of my songs. Uh, I, I'm very much affected by all the natural songs, uh, sounds in the world. So there's that and then there's uh, associations you develop, I guess, over the years as to what a song is really all about. And, uh, you know, there's okay. some, something mystical about the Civil War, you know. It's all coming back again, yeah. you know. People are getting interested again in what all that meant, what that, that Matt, you know. Okay, I, I believe that, that uh, we're going to throw the floor open to questions for Mr. Crumb. So, yeah.
I was just going to ask about um, notation and the new technology as you <coughs> run along. Has it helped you? And have you taken to it? Computerized? Yeah, computer notation. Computer stuff. And Could you hear the question? Uh, I've never, all, all of my students use computer notation. I still use pen and ink. And, uh, you know, I never learned any new tricks. But there's something about, uh, I love the struggle, you know, with, uh, with uh, writing the score out in a very laborious fashion. Like I'm in a monastic cell and doing my penance, you know, that way. <laughs> I think you have to suffer for music, you know. For, for those who, who've never seen these scores, there, there are a bunch of them there that are on exhibit, uh, including the, um, some of the pages from Ancient Voices of Children. And um, they're, they're really unlike any scores you've, you've ever seen. Um, those who play George's music always play from score. A lot, of, a lot of composers, you play from parts. But everybody who plays a piece of George's plays from his manuscript. And um, that's a very special thing. I, I, you know, if you're not a performer, I don't think it makes sense. But somehow, the, the computer notarized, notated music is just not the same thing as, as playing this music that is issued from the composer's hand. And, and everybody who does George's music loves that about it. It's, don't ever change, as if you could. <laughs> well, today I had a chance to look at uh, some Brahms, you know, original scores and uh, some other pieces, you know, all by Merit Watzek, and there's some magic in the handwriting, but even engraving, and that's not as, uh, that's not as mechanical as this uh, computer not notation. It, uh, even engraving erases that personality. So if you can play the Mozart rondos on the piano from his, from a facsimile, that's a great experience. I have kind of a two-part question. Uh -huh. The 40s and 50s, I studied with Roy Harris, and he was doing little pieces like the Blackbird and from folk songs. And I wonder whether there was something about the 40s and 50s that revived us. He's Oklahoma. Uh, and, and of course, a great film that came out of West Virginia called Mate One makes great use of some folk singing in church. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this move into, from, from the churches and from the folk singers into the concert hall, mm -hmm. could you speak to that at all? Uh, yes, well, many of those styles are very exciting in themselves. I've heard uh, Appalachian folk singers that have a, such a metallic voice you can't believe it. Sounds almost like a Russian soprano, you know. And I love that sound. I lo that sounds in my ear. So my daughter, Anne, when she did the Appalachian song, she imitated that timbre of the voice in a song called Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown? The high note was just so metallic and ringing, you know. And uh, all, all of the uh, spirituals, that's just part of our psyche nowadays. I hope it's not lost these days. I hope the young people still recognize those songs. And uh, maybe my settings, I uh, hope it would help to keep some of them going, you know, if they're not already. Oh, we lost. That's, that's, what, that's what that's what's the problem is. <laughs> I don't know how much you missed, but... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry, I know. There you are. Okay. It's really interesting to me. Um, tonight, we're going to hear these songs sung by a, a really great singer um, in, the, in, the, in the really great singer sense of being a great singer. And yet, these songs have been written really for um, uh, a much smaller voice. Uh, usually, the singers uh, amplify uh, in, in performance um, because there's an incredible din created in the percussion. And, um, and these pieces, I find remarkably, we were at the rehearsal earlier today, and they, they adapt so beautifully to, to very different kinds of voices, both in terms of gender, going back and forth, uh, male and female singers, and in terms of, of actual vocal quality, um, more or less folk type singers and, and now a, a very heroic voice. So I, it's, it's really stunning to me that, that um, this kind of music can have such a, um, a, 
a viability among such a large range of, of voices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was actually going to ask a similar question. I'm sorry. Of, of the 49 uh, songs, I know that you rig originally wrote were inspired by your daughter, Anne, a, a lighter voice. And uh, Mr. Sarabin just said that different voices, uh, different styles of singing could take mm -hmm. those four, 49. So you initially did not divide them between male and, and female personas. Uh, yeah, well, I started with the idea of the female voice since it was my daughter's request. And then it occurred to me that two of the books, at least, of the first four could be either male or female. And I'm sure certain songs from the other books, too, could uh, you know, be used uh, for the opposite gender. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I sort of had the female voice in mind, but the three later books of the uh, song, seven song books are for both a male and a female voice. And sometimes there's kind of a real duet, or at least there's an alternation. You know, it varies how I use the two voices. My, my question then would be, is Mr. Hampson interested in working with all 49 songs and, and traveling the world and doing Well, he hasn't, he hasn't committed himself. Okay. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> So. Uh, oh, I, yeah, I wanted to mention, too, that originally I'd notated in the score that these were for amplified voice. Because, you know, usually a folk singer, as David said, is a, is a smaller voice. It's kind of an intimate voice in a way, you know. And, uh, uh, of course, I didn't think that maybe I'd have a real operatic, a heroic uh, a baritone. <laughs> And uh, you can almost just dispense with the amplification. A couple places you have to bring the percussion down just a bit, you know. But, uh, you know, different voices are nice. I think uh, I love uh, different styles of singing, you know, and uh, uh, makes for variety. <laughs> you have a question back there? Uh, Mr. Crump, what are you working on now? Uh, well, I've just finished uh, book seven just a, f a very few months ago. I'm doing a little editing, trying to get certain works ready for publication. Uh, there's some other pieces I hope I can get around to writing, you know, that I've long had in mind. Uh, some chamber pieces, maybe some other songs. I should get back to solo piano one of these days. Orchestra, I haven't done much with orchestra recently. I, I sort of feel that, uh, you know, the, I feel the uh, Im, Im, impetus is towards uh, smaller performing forces uh, because uh, with my music at least, uh, with the requirements for special timbres and sometimes rhythmic things, uh, it seems more practical to write for smaller groups. Although you'll hear orchestra effects in the in the songbooks. Yeah, I, this is essentially orchestral music. Uh, it's just played by by five players, piano and four percussionists. But they're playing on more than a hundred instruments, and so the the effect is orchestral, both in its color variety and in terms of its dynamic range, which is huge. Um, but it's, it's interesting you, you speak of your orchestra music and b that being a, something that probably you're not going to do again because you've, he's composed four orchestra pieces um, that he acknowledges uh, over, over, you know, a, quite a span of time, you know, maybe 40, 50 years. And um, those pieces have, have presented, one of them is, is fairly easy to do. Um, Haunted landscape. Type. Haunted landscape, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the other three present performance problems that, that have defeated many orchestras that have, have tried them. And I, I suppose that that's been frustrating to you. Uh, yeah, when something doesn't work, it's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> I that's wouldn't right. say they don't work. Yeah, yeah. But, but they need a lot of rehearsal and a lot yeah. of care. That's and, the problem. Yeah. is that orchestras are, you know, it's an economic crunch. They don't have time to sometimes polish things. You know, rehearsal minutes are going by and this is costing hundreds of dollars per minute or something for an orchestra. 
I guess. So that uh, you never get around eventually to covering all the points, you know, which you can do in, in a smaller chamber situation. Yeah. <laughs> I, think I, I like this nice. topic. It opens up a can of worms uh, because uh, you mentioned that he only, he only wrote four orchestral pieces. I'm curious about your opinion on uh, new music's relationship with orchestral music, with orchestras. Uh, why, why have you only written four pieces? Could you please speak on that? Sure. Oh, I think many of the pieces I've heard, you know, including some of my students, have been doing very well in the orchestra field. Uh, uh, and uh, there are certain European composers, you know, who have written really beautiful orchestral pieces. But uh, the composers are different, you know. There's some composers like Chopin, all he needs is a piano, you know, really. Writes very little else. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a personal thing, I, I think, always. But I, I, hope, I hope orchestras always exist, if, if only to play the Mahler symphonies over and over. <laughs> a few other pieces. And too. a few other pieces, too. <laughs> a handful of other pieces. A handful, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big handful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Alan Mandel. Um, uh, I think George has made a wonderful contribution for solo piano. Uh, I've played um, uh, Macrocosmos one and two and the five piano pieces, but there's one limitation, uh, and that is I scheduled the five piano pieces in Tunisia, mm -hmm. and uh, they only had an upright piano, uh, so I couldn't uh, uh, pluck the strings. It would be difficult. Uh, yes. I would have had to uh, uh, bore into the uh, piano. Yeah. Well, I grew up with an upright piano. That's as a kid, I, I practiced on an upright piano, but that was before I, you know. I'd heard that there was such a thing as a composer like John Cage that explored other aspects, or Cal, Henry Cal, you know. But I, there weren't recordings, at least none that I heard in the early 60s, so I was kind of forced to go my own way to do my own exploration of that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are the practical things. Oh, in the old days, uh, piano tuners hated you, and, and institutions gave you their worst piano, you know. Oh, it still Real, exists. Oh, it still exists. It still exists. I mean, we have uh, every recording <laughs> session where we do a new piece of George's for, for piano, uh, if, if you're happy, if you happen to rent a, a really nice piano or happen to luck into a really valuable piano that, that sounds great, there's inevitably someone who's in charge who will come along and look askance at you going inside and marking mm -hmm. all of your harmonics and nodes and, mm -hmm. and taking percussive beaters to the strings, mm -hmm. they don't like it at all. It's, it's I know, I know. And you know something about that. You know, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> uh, do you know, but nothing I do hurts the piano. The piano may have to be tuned a little sooner after it's been <laughs> <laughs> But nothing else. I, I wouldn't hurt the piano. They're too expensive. Uh, uh, you might say that the moisture on the fingers might corrode the strings. Well, there's moisture in the air. That corrodes the strings, you know. Nothing I would ever do a person, <laughs> on purpose to hurt an instrument, you know. But this thing persists, and it used to be the Steinway people, oh, they were ferocious against this kind of music, you know. And then one, one issue they featured me on the front of their Steinway magazine. I never could figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it makes a lot of sense because your music probably generates more sales for them as the instruments deteriorate. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but how many how many clunkers did we see because uh, an institution didn't want to give give you their best piano, you know? So that happened over and over. Thing is changing a tiny bit, but still it exists. Maybe we should call it <laughs> an afternoon and, and get ready for the concert. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.